G'day everyone and welcome to the Track Zone Spotlight. Well, I'm on location here at the University of Queensland because it's time to talk about gravitational waves and black holes. Well, joining me to discuss gravitational waves and black holes is Professor Tamara Davis. Professor, thanks so much for joining me on the show again. Thanks so much for having me. Tell us about gravitational waves. Okay, so gravitational waves form when you have something like two black holes that are spiralling around each other. As they move, the, gra the gravitational effect of them um, sort of ripples out and that makes a gravitational wave pass through space. And it's actually a ripple in space itself. It's lengths stretching and contracting. And the times that we see it most impressively is when you get two black holes, they lose energy through these gravitational waves as they orbit each other, and they slowly infall and coalesce into a single black hole. And that collision event of two black holes is the really exciting stuff that was seen by LIGO, the gravitational wave detector over in the States. So on the Trekzone Spotlight, I've been featuring radio telescopes. Mm -hmm. This is a completely different way of looking at the universe, isn't it? Exactly. This is really exciting because it's something that we've never been able to do before. Every, all the information that we have from space and about the world around us up there is has come from light, whether it's optical light with the, tel the telescopes that have shiny mirrors or radio light with the telescopes that are big white dishes, or if we go on to in the other direction and see uh, the um, really, really high energy things like gamma rays and x-rays. All that way, gamma rays to infrared, optical to radio is all just light. So we've only ever been able to see. With gravitational waves, we're sort of now able to hear the universe or feel the universe. We have a completely new sense, a completely different way at understanding processes that are going on in the universe around us. For someone that isn't fully versed in all of this, I look out at the lake behind us yep. with these ripples coming off the fountain. Is, mm -hmm. is that analogous to gravitational waves in the universe? Yeah, sort of. The, way, the ripples coming, coming across the water are going, going up and down. The way that um, gravitational waves travel is imagine if you have like a ring and it gets uh, compressed and then stretched and then compressed and stretched as it travels. And so it sort of squishes things in one way and stretches them in the other. And that's actually how they were detected. The um, gravitational wave detector has two arms that sort of go like this. And what you've got lasers going up one arm and down the other arm and reflecting off mirrors and being redetected at the center. Now, the arms of these detectors are four kilometers long. So, and the reason is because the changes that you get from gravitational waves are so tiny that even with over four kilometers, the change that you get is smaller than the change uh, the size of a, a proton oh, wow. and to, to, to think that we can detect those differences is just a huge technological achievement um, but the way it's done is one arm of the um, of the detector will shorten while the other one lengthens and then that one will shorten and that one will lengthen and you can see this ripple pattern and um, and you can see that varying and that's the signal we detect to make us understand that a gravitational wave has just passed through Earth. What does the research allow us to learn? So we can do things that we've never done before. So we have not had many tests of how gravity works in really strong gravitational fields. So if you have two black holes coalescing, exactly how does that happen? How do they merge? Do they stretch into each other or, or what goes on? We've never been able to do that before. Um, and the second thing um, that we can do is uh, now the second detection, well, not the second detection of gravitational waves, but the second type of thing that was detected with gravitational waves were merging neutron stars. Now, neutron stars are really, really funky. It's like you take the mass of the sun and compress it into something the size of Brisbane. Um, it's, uh, you have super, super dense things. It's basically like having an enormous nucleus. Um, and so it's, you can test how the matter inside a nucleus behaves by looking at how these ripples um, form when two neutron stars merge. Uh, now that, that one in particular was uh, super exciting because when you have the neutron stars merge, you also get an explosion. When two black holes merge, nothing happens. You can't see anything. But when two neutron stars merge, it goes kaboom. Uh, you get what's known as a kilonova. Uh, and that's where a huge amount of um, like the precious metals are created. So things like gold. You can't easily create a lot of gold in a normal supernova explosion and all that sort of stuff. So when you talk about us being made of the elements that were created in stars, 
uh, a lot of the things like gold have to be created in uh, these merging neutron stars. So is there a big concern then if we've got kilonovas happening in our galactic neighbourhood that we're going to start seeing uh, meteorites of gold raining down oh, on us wouldn't that be we're all going to be rich? No, I think if that was uh, going to happen it would be sort of ha happening already. But it's the, one of the key things that came out of this discovery of the two neutron stars colliding was that in this collision um, probably more than a thousand solar masses, oh, sorry, sorry, earth masses, so a thousand times the mass of the Earth in gold was produced in these, this collision. Wow. That's a lot of gold. That's worth a lot of money to someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what does that help us to learn? Is that about how Earth's created and where we come from? Yeah, so we learned stuff about how all the elements are created. Um, we'd made predictions that this kind of thing should happen and they were sort of confirmed by what was, was seen there. So that's really exciting. We can also learn some really other uh, important things. So we can test whether gravity really does travel at the speed of light, which is something we have always sort of assumed but never really been able to prove. So the light from the kilonova, the explosion, arrived about the same time as the gravitational waves, just two seconds difference. And we can explain why that two seconds would occur by the fact it takes a little while for light to escape, but gravitational waves get out instantly. So uh, we confirmed that uh, gravity travels at the speed of light, which is confirming a, a prediction that had taken 100 years to be able to try and prove. And we can also use these things to measure the expansion of the universe. Like, I use supernovae, exploding stars, to measure the expansion of the universe. Using these also gives us a new way to measure how the universe is expanding and teach us a bit about things like dark energy and dark matter and what's, cause it, like help, what's um, causing the big changes in the evolution of the expansion of the universe as a whole. Well, Tamara, will you stick around for next week because I want to jump into dark matter and, and black holes? Yep, absolutely. No worries.